And so I got in, um, walked all around the factory, did what I needed to do, so I stole some um, some bits and pieces, and we planted a few key loggers, cables in the back of the computers, and they were rinsed. So we just showed them the film of what we did and all the photographs. And I just remember the security, head of security, just putting his head in his hands and just over and over again saying, two million, because they'd spent two million pounds on the defences and, and it was all for nothing in the face of, you know, a, a cheeky scouser, really. The legitimate term now, the term that everyone uses, is social engineering. So that would be the manipulation of human characteristics in order to gain unauthorised access to buildings or data or information. From 70 up to all the way up to sort of 95% of breaches and of cybercrime is facilitated by the mistake or manipulation of a human being. So social engineering is behind phishing attacks, it's behind you know, fake texts, it's behind all the fraud, all the cons, everything that you see and hear. Someone has to click on the link, someone has to give the information, someone has to start chatting to someone over social media and create that avenue of opportunity for a criminal or someone emulating, simulating a criminal, criminal attack to get into a business. So that's what social engineering really is. And of course, from the physical point of view, it's everything about getting into a building when you shouldn't be able to get in. So spoofing, faking passes, um, you know, following people, you know, tailgating through, without a pass through, through security doors. Were there any experiences that you think shaped your direction in life? I was um, about seven years old and I was kidnapped by a neighbour. Um, now, I wasn't here particularly physically, although she didn't let me go. It was an older teenager. I was out playing with my friends. But what happened after that was my parents decided that it would be a good idea to, for me to um, hang out more with some of my cousins because they would teach me to be a bit more streetwise. But what my parents didn't know uh, at the time was that my cousins were already sort of into petty crime um, and were already doing something called urbex, which is urban exploration. So they were getting in and out of empty buildings all over Liverpool not to take or break anything, um, but just to look around. And so I started following them. I would have been, as I say, seven or eight years old, started following them and going on jobs with them. You learn very quickly when you do that. So you learn how to pick locks. You learn the way the heartbeat of a building. So, you know, the way people move in and around the building, the lines of drift, which is, a, you know, the way that people use spaces. And you learn those things. You learn to run very quickly. I learned trespass law as I was older. Um, and by the time, you know, I, I got to be a teenager, we'd been in and out of hundreds of buildings in and around all the whole country, but mostly uh, the Liverpool area in the northwest. So what was the point where you realised that you could turn this hobby into a career? The cousins had started doing air security work as doormen on the clubs and the bars in the city centre. And the only people in Liverpool with any money that, at that time were the football players. And so they said, well, look, you, know, you guys can you know, break into anywhere. Can you come and check our houses? Because they had these great big houses sort of on the outskirts of the city. Um, can you come and check if you can get in? And of course we did. But then they have businesses as well. And so now can you get into the businesses? And that was when it really started paying quite well. And if you can imagine, I did a waitressing job at the time. And I was paid uh, about £15 a day for the waitressing job. But one of those jobs would pay me about 300 quid. So it was... It was just a no-brainer. At the time, to be, a, to be someone who broke into buildings for a living, or who talked their way past security, um, I figured wouldn't have been too great for my career. So I kept it very, very quiet, and um, everything was done uh, word of mouth. Can you talk us through the sort of clients you've had and why they'd hire you, like for what purpose? I mean, I had one corporate client that said, look, we've, we've spent millions on the perimeter. Um, and the fence is high, you know, we've got security guards. You, you won't get in unless someone leaves the door open for you, you know. And so got my little crew together as a few people and we, we needed to do two things. We needed to get inside the fence and then we need to get inside. It, it was a factory, so we need to get inside the factory. So we find a lot of the ways to break into a building or the ways to get to someone is through something called open source intelligence or OSINT. And we researched that building and we researched those people. And we researched it and we found out that they had this great benefits package which included MOTs and basic car maintenance 
in their car park at the office. So to get past um, the security guards uh, inside the fence, um, we got a, a pellet gun and we shot out the windscreen of one of the cars in the car park, one of the manager's cars, and we just cracked the windscreen um, of one of these cars. And then turned up in a van with, um, you know, let's just say it said Jen's Auto Repair on the side of the van, one of these magnetic signs, and just said, we've come to look at the car with the crack windscreen. And security just wave you through, you see, because there you are, it's a legitimate reason. Um, and I'm in the back of the van and my two associates are driving in. They drive in, they look at the windscreen for a bit, and meanwhile, I get out and I hide, right? And so the boys look at the, the windscreen, they go to the security guard and they say, look, you know, this is beyond what we've got now. Sorry about that, you'll have to call someone else, knowing that the firm will just call their regular um, people and, and, and they'll fix it. But I'm inside the fence by now. And what we'd seen is that the company was very rules driven. They were very sort of uh, old fashioned really. And you know, if your manager said something in this firm, then that was the law. So we just got a piece of paper, put the logo on the top, the company logo, which we got off the internet. And I just wrote, please do not close this store. Thank you. And signed it like a vague signature with HR written underneath it. And we stuck it to one of the fire doors. And this is where social engineering gets clever because psychologically speaking, you know, you're a rules driven person, you work for a rules driven company. If someone tells you to leave a door open, you leave the door open. This guy comes out, sees the sign and goes, oh, wedges the door open. And then loads of people came out the door and every single one of them see other people ignoring it, cognitive bias, social proof, see everybody leaving the door open um, and left the door open. And so I got in. Um, walked all around the factory, did what I needed to do, so I stole some um, some bits and pieces and we planted a few key loggers, cables in the back of the computers and they were rinsed. And if I'd have been a criminal, um, then that would have been a very dangerous situation given what the factory actually made, um, but we're not. So we just showed them the film of what we did and all the photographs. And I just remember the security, the head of security just putting his head in his hands and just over and over again saying, two million, two million, Brian, because they'd spent two million pounds on the defences and, and it was all for nothing in the face of, you know, a, a cheeky scouser, really. Why don't we talk about the job that made you stop working for a year? So by the time I got to my sort of mid to late 20s, um, I'd done, you know, hundreds of jobs, uh, most of which uh, were in the UK. But I had done a fair few abroad as well. So I was in the hotel in Hong Kong and I got a call from um, a client who booked me a few times, you know, a, a year and still does book me a few times a year. And what he wanted me to do um, was to go to an address in this city um, and get to this person's desk inside um, a house and look for a name in, in, a, in their address book. Um, in their desk. And if I found the name, I had a message I had to write on a post-it note and leave on the desk. I decided to go and do my uh, reconnaissance of, of this address. And this was on um, sort of a Friday night, Friday evening, about sort of 6 p.m. And I get to uh, a golf club in, in a cab, come out of the golf club and I walked towards this address. And it was the quietest neighbourhood that I've, you know, that you can imagine. Huge, big sort of mansion houses, beautiful gardens, but there wasn't so much as a, a dog barking or a car moving. It was just like a ghost neighbourhood. And I walk for a while and then I see the Target building. And it's just a great big mansion, like a colonial style thing with sort of stairs up the side of it and everything and a garden. And I looked and I thought, like, there's no one in. There's no one in. There's no one in the street. Never mind the house. So I look through the gates and sort of touch the gate, and the gate's not locked. And and I thought, okay, this will be a doddle. Um, and I went back to the hotel. By now it's about nine o'clock on the Friday night, and I actually got undressed. So I actually, you know, ran a bath, just the, the hot bath, put some bubbles in the bath, got undressed, ready to have my bath, and I was going to have a bath, have some dinner couple of drinks, early night, ready to go the next evening. And then I just looked and just thought, I'm going to do it now. I mean, why wait? Right, it's empty, um, it's easy, I'm going to do it now. So I put my clothes back on and I thought, 
This will be over so quickly that that bath wash will still be hot when I get back. Fine. Now, I had nothing with me to do a job. So I had to think about, well, what do I take? What can I improvise? So I looked around the room and there was a, you know, there was not much, there was a beer bottle opener, I think I took that. And then I go down in the lift and got to the uh, hotel, there's a little shop in the lobby. And I bought like a, you know, a little, ho a little sort of key ring torch thing from the hotel shop, get in a cab and get back to the golf club. And I go to the, um, to the target house and I climb, uh, I go in and at the bottom of the stairs I hear a phone ring inside the building and it goes and it goes and nobody picks up the phone, answer machine kicks in, there's nobody in, this is going to be easy. And you know, it was easy to get in. I, I walked up the stairs, there were like French doors and I get the bottle opener and I just thought, I'm going to jimmy the lock, those, those French doors, if you've got them, get additional security. And then I thought, you know what? Just try first. Security only works if you use it. Just went like that and the door opened. It wasn't even locked. And I remember thinking, my contact had said to me, this guy says his home's impenetrable, right? So the client is the owner of the house. I've spoken to my client, his home's impenetrable. And I thought, what a load of rubbish. Like, this isn't even difficult. He doesn't even bother to lock his doors. And that should have been a big clue because what kind of person doesn't bother locking the doors? The type of person who isn't bothered about people breaking in because nobody's going to break in, right? Nobody's brave enough to break in. So what you do is you never carry anything you don't need. You travel as light as you can. So I just put the um, bottle opener down at the bottom of the stairs with the torch because you know the torch was rubbish anyway and just left and so covered them with a few leaves i'll pick them up on the way out and i went in through there into a, a bedroom with an unmade bed and then walked around like the top of a great big landing and down these stairs and sure enough exactly where i had been told it would be was was this office with a great big fish tank in the dark and i get to the desk smells of like sandalwood and the fish tanks there and a huge big leather kind of throne of a chair. And I'm thinking, this is lovely. What a nice office, very unlived in place, but you know, fine. So I get to the, um, and I sat in the chair and I was kind of doing, you know, little spins on the chair and everything and looking at the fish. And I look in the address book and I find the name almost immediately because it was one of very few names that were in English. So I write the message I'm supposed to leave, put it on the desk. And then I saw these two sets of headlights pull up just outside the house. So like the office is on the ground floor, there's like windows and stuff and it sort of illuminated the hall. And at the minute that that happened, I knew I shouldn't be there. I knew that if I was caught, well, I mean, I shouldn't be there. And like these people who were pulling up, who, whoever they were, probably didn't know anything about this. So dashed out, ran up the stairs, ran back out of the bedroom window that I got in on sort of ran a little bit down the stairs and tripped a little bit. And in the drive, um, there were these two huge black four by fours, each driven by um, a heavy, like, like a security guard, like heavies, right? Um, so I flung myself really quickly to the wall of the garden so that like the shadow, um, I kind of merged into the foliage and the shadows. Um, I'm face down because I knew that my face would be the, like would show up against the, the darkness of the soil and my clothes. And I just pushed myself up against the wall. And I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, I know I'm not meant to be here. Like if they find me, there's no explaining this. I knew there and then that this was um, not something I could get out of. I couldn't smile my way out of it. They looked like they had absolutely no sense of humour whatsoever. Like. And I hear them crunching on the gravel, get to the front door, and they're talking on these walkie-talkies. And I kind of, I don't really know how it happened, but they'd gone into the house to look for, for me. I mean, they were looking for me. And they were coming in and out and they're talking, and then I heard them uh, getting guns out and I could hear them cocking these guns. And I remember thinking then, I've used up my nine lives, and this was a stupid career choice. And that if anything happens now, no one knows where I am. Not my legitimate job, my colleague, um, you know, and not my family. The only person who would know would be the client and it wouldn't be in their interest to say if I went missing. 
So I was seeing all these headlines, you know, Scouse woman goes missing in Asia, businesswoman never found. And then just as quickly as they turned up, they just ran out the house, slammed the door, got into the cars and just left. Got wobbly to my feet um, and walked. You'd never run, ever, ever, ever. You've got to walk. And I walked out of the gate and gradually picked up speed. It's a digital at the end, but not for a long time. Got back to the golf club, picked up a cab and said to the cab driver, get me back to the hotel. And so go back to the hotel and crying, tears streaming down my face. I was just like so scared and everything that all sort of came in. And by now it's about quarter past three in the morning. And I walked into the bar and the bar was one of these very, you know, very swanky, hotels in Asia with a mirror and three o'clock in the morning and I had like twigs hanging out my hair and cuts and my, 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 my little connies were little trainers were cut and, and you know there was tears everywhere and I, I had muck all over me and I sat down at the bar and I says to the guy get me a drink that's very alcoholic but a kid could drink because I need you need sugar to reset right when your adrenaline kicks off like that and he put, hands me this sort of horrible, sweet, alcoholic concoction. And I kind of knocked it straight back. And he said to me, um, in a tough night, he said, do you want a beer, chaser with that? And the minute he said it, I was oh my God, I've left the beer opener with the hotel name at the scene. I, I'm like, that's it, they'll know where I am if they go back and get it. But I was so exhausted and so, I mean, I couldn't have done anything. Uh, really. So I had another drink, went back to my room, bath was cold, um, and just fell on the bed. And when I woke up, it was about 2 p.m. the next day. Uh, and I just got out of there straight away. So like, I just, I, I, almost, I passed out basically and got on the plane and got home. I got a call from the client and he knew I'd left the beer, so they had found it afterwards. And he said, why? You were supposed to go in on the Saturday, not the Friday. Um, and you know, and I said, I, I know, I know, it was a stupid thing to do. I said, but I don't want to talk about that actually, because you sent me into a situation that was that was very dangerous. And I said, so I never want to talk about this again. You've you've had an in incredible career. It's gone in lots of different directions. What are your hopes for the future? It would be nice now to pass this on. So ethical social engineering um, and manipulation is the best defence against malicious social engineering. We're looking to teach people how to do this, a, a select sort of few people will train to do that. And I also speak a lot about it and spread the words of how you can be hacked uh, to, you know, through social engineering. I'm a bit old uh, and, and less fit than I used to be, so I really am done with scrambling about on rooftops too much, although I still do three or four jobs a year just to just to stay current. Now it's more relevant than ever before um, to, to teach people how to, how to avoid this and how to recognise it. It does real harm, you know, um, on the malicious side. So it needs us to be there to stop it. So that's really what I want to do in the future. I had to strip down to next to nothing, grease up, put a towel over the cut section of bar off the window so it wouldn't scratch my back and levered myself out well, Sten wrenched that up just another little inch, probably strangling everybody he'd always hated since childhood, but just enough for me to get out.